I have 6.30, so I would like to uh, convene this meeting with the Board of Directors for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for August 3rd, 2023. Holly, would you take roll, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director False. Here. Director Mayhood uh, is out with a medical issue and would like to be excused from this meeting. I want to make a motion that we excuse her. Second. President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director False? Yes. Okay. Um, Manager Rogers, any additions or deletions? Um, yes, Chair, I'd like to, before we get into the meeting, I'd like to introduce uh, Garrett Roth to the board and to the public, um, our new district engineer. Um, Garrett, uh, before um, attending college at Cal Poly State University, San Luis Obispo, grew up in Ben Loman, and graduated from San Lorenzo Valley High. Uh, in the past, uh, Garrett's been working for a civil and structural engineering firm for over a decade, where he uh, earned a registration as a professional civil engineer and gained valuable experience with engineering design, permit approval, process, con and construction management. Garrett is a familiar face to the district as he's worked on several of the district's projects, including uh, just recently the project manager for the Fall Creek Fish Lab. I'd like you all to welcome Garrett. Welcome, Garrett. Um, <laughs> it's nice to have you here. We appreciate the work that you're going to be able to do for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, moving on to oral communications. Uh, this portion of the agenda is reserved for oral communications from the public on a subject that lies within the jurisdiction of the district uh, that is not on the agenda for this evening. Um, reminder throughout uh, this portion and other portions of the meeting, uh, uh, members of the public are uh, requested to keep their uh, presentations within a three minute limit. Um, and uh, we have a timer. Uh, I don't have one at the moment to represent that. Um, if need be. So Melissa, you have a timer, a three minute timer. Does any we have a member, three minute timer? Does any member of the public uh, wish to speak? Yes. Um, so if you would uh, identify yourself. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris Keller. Uh, these are my neighbors, um, Steve Farrow and Edward Cody. We live on Brookside Drive in Felton, California. Some of you may be familiar with us. Uh, I do have statements for everybody. I don't know the best way to distribute. Yeah, why don't you it right now? You can give them to me. Okay, Holly will take them. So thank you for your time. Um, we, like most of Santa Cruz County, were impacted by the storm on December 31st. Uh, we live on a private road. It's about a quarter of a mile. And um, during the New Year's Eve event, um, so much water came down that it washed away our road. And um, we it exposed the pipes, uh, San Lorenzo pipes. Uh, you'll see pictures uh, in the pamphlet. Um, it's been a hard road for us. There's 12 households, four of them still cannot reach their homes. Um, we are very concerned because we're in fire uh, season and the CCU fire came within a mile of our homes. Um, and that was very scary. And now a fire truck can't make it up our road because um, of the storm. And we have successfully um, been granted through FEMA uh, at this point, almost $300,000 to um, redo our road. And we're very grateful for that. Uh, we're unable to really move forward until the exposed pipes are dealt with. And uh, I know that there's a lot of a need out there and you guys have your plate full. And there's a lot of aging infrastructure, not just ours. Um, so we are just asking if you could review our situation and um, we just wanna uh, be on the radar and, and uh, invite you to, to work with us in collaboration. Uh, Rick has um, 
granted a survey to begin next week. Uh, so thank you, Rick. Um, we'll see what comes from that. We are working with uh, Granite Construction. Uh, they will be doing the, the uh, repair and uh, the uh, infrastructure. Are the we're on a creek, so parts of our road are inside the creek. So there's a lot to do, um, and he would love to bid the project as well. Whatever work uh, needs to be done. Um, so yes, uh, we do have some questions in there. You can review them, and perhaps we'll be on the agenda uh, next time. Uh, what else? Um, actually, I would like to ask. I know that there's a budgetary shortfall or concern regarding budget, but I heard that you guys got fifteen million dollars for projects. Is that accurate in Santa Cruz? Um, no. Okay. Well, I can't, so that's, that's I can't inaccurate. Well, okay. We can answer, we can answer questions. Um, yeah. But I don't know whether if you want me to answer, I will. Sure. Yes, we do. We did receive loans, and I don't know if that's the exact amount, but it's close to it. And that money has been allocated for projects, mm -hmm. and some of those projects are already in construction. I did just speak with um, Congressman Panetta's office today. Um, many of you were copied on the email that I sent last week. Uh, they've been very helpful from the beginning, getting our FEMA claims uh, through all the hoops. And he is going to address the delay and reimbursement from the CCU fires. I know you guys spent a lot of money and you're still waiting on those FEMA reimbursements. Um, so that makes, you know, our project more challenging. So he is going to be responding to that. And perhaps there's a way to streamline the funds so that the project like ours won't go um, you know, unnoticed and we can address the issues. Uh, I'm just concerned for my neighbors. You know, I have four households, they still can't, they're still renting. They're not able to, to access their homes. And like I said, the, the fire thing uh, is very concerning. And also the winter, our road won't uh, last another one, but we had this past time. Um, so I think the pictures kind of tell our story as well. So just want to thank you for your time and for your consideration. Yeah, so we had four trees call uh, fall. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with y'all, but um, uh, they have agreed. PG&E has agreed to to come back and retrieve all these uh, remnants of the tree that have, were left in our road. But they're concerned about going up our road because of the the exposed pipes. And yesterday, the tree uh, did run over one of the pipes, and so we had a break. Um, and that's what we're concerned about because um, we really can't pave over you know, over. Yeah. Pipes that are 90 to 100 years old. So, yeah. okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> because it's not on our agenda. Yes. The board can't, can't discuss it this evening. Okay. Uh, we will review this information, and Rick, I think it's appropriate to uh, put this on an agenda uh, for soon. Uh, for the next, next, meeting. Meeting. The next meeting. Yeah, yeah okay. that's possible. And, and could we also review the FEMA projects that came out of the rainstorms as well? Um, because the money that we were talking about before was for CZU, and I don't know that I've got a good handle on what the FEMA projects are for the storms. None of the new projects in the winter of this year have been obligated, so there's not even approval. To but at least the ones that are, can at least the candidates that we're asking for. Could we redo, review that? Well, I'll, we'll bring you the, the damage list. Yeah. That is, you know, a lot of these projects or none of these projects have been obligated. So there is no money available from or, or FEMA for the, any of the new projects in 2023. I'd like to know if we've made requests. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So we let's just have all the status. Yeah. Right. Mark, can I, in, in discussing that, if we're able to at the next meeting or as soon as possible, um, in addition to the list of projects that we are seeking FEMA um, reimbursement for, for the, from the storm events. Could we talk about whether there um, is an appropriate way or a possible way for us to prioritize them? Because, you know, if there are projects that are preventing people from reaching their homes, for example, I think that that should be discussed with a different level of priority than, you know, one where people can still pass. If that's possible, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't know what else is on that list, to be honest, in terms of you know other damage that we're looking at. So, okay. Next meeting, then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Seventeenth. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time. It's great. We've all been very kind. Thank, thank you for coming. Same place. Yes. In two weeks. In two weeks. Then.
Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you for bringing thank this you. to our attention. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the public? I see none in online remotely. Okay. We can proceed then. Um, first item is uh, unfinished business, the emergency contract for Quail Hollow. Rick? Yes, thank you. Um, at the uh, a previous meeting, uh, the board uh, approved an emergency contract with Anderson Pacific for trench failure on, on Quail Hollow Road. Um, during uh, the Early, early January, February, during the heavy rainfall events, uh, the trench failed uh, on Quail Hollow Road, right uh, in a new 12 inch main project that we probably have been less than six months have been completed. The road opened up to the uh, extent that uh, uh, it was dangerous for vehicles to pass um, and it had to be steel plated. And the county requested the district move right in and uh, facilitate uh, repairs. Uh, the board did approve an expenditure of approximately $250,000 for uh, exploration of, of the failed potable water main trench in Quail Hollow. Uh, since that approval, uh, Anderson Pacific has opened the areas around the pipeline and we found considerable uh, voids uh, along our pipeline trench and even out into uh, the adjoining lanes. Uh, some of the area was up to about 14 foot wide uh, voids uh, in Quail Hollow Road. Um, those have been repaired and under drain has been put in uh, uh, recompaction, slurry, um, um, and permeable um, base rock is put in to, to restore the road. We're still doing exploration and finding voids, although it appears that the voids are coming to an end. They're getting much, much smaller and, and much more easier and right around our, our pipeline. We do have one area that we haven't done exploration yet, and that is up right next to the entrance to uh, Quail Hollow Ranch. There is probably uh, 12 inch round circles or indentations where you can see down into the into the ground that the, the, the that the soil the roadway has collapsed. So um, we have expensed our funds and are close to even ex expensing. Uh, 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 we'll be close to expensing the six hundred thousand or very very shortly. Um, we're still working out there. Uh, we hope this will come to an end. Um, there was some some real serious undermining at the first location, and this location appears to be a lot less. Um, but we'll uh, we won't know until we continue with exploration. Uh, there is some hazards out there with uh, the road opening up, and you know we don't know just how big of a void is underneath the road. So we need to continue with the emergency exploration. I'm asking you amend the contract and not to exceed uh, 600,000. Again, uh, working with FEMA this week on multiple projects, and including the Brookside Drive project uh, and this project, this project is not obligated as of yet either. And we're expensing money um, that uh, we're not sure we're gonna be reimbursed for on this project, but it's with our main line, we need to move ahead. Um, I'm asking the board uh, to uh, to approve uh, the contract amendment. Garrett is was on the project uh, when we hired MME um, uh, to uh, manage uh, after after Josh, and uh, he could probably answer questions up to to the degree of uh, the holes that were were found. And with that, I'll try to we'll try to answer questions. Okay. All right. Um, I'm concerned about the entire pipeline because it, a lot of it cuts through that same kind of um, ground. And my understanding is that was constructed in exact conformance with county standards, county requirements, correct? The, the backfill, the trench, 
yes, the pipeline was installed to district standards, which uh, I, I do believe not only it's ductile iron, which is probably the best in, in my opinion, yeah. but we've also, uh, Garrett, correct me if I'm wrong, we have field lock gaskets. That's so correct. each joint is restrained. Although it's not good not to have a bench around your pipe and so forth, you don't want it to kick right. or, or to move. Um, but at this point, I, we haven't found any damage to the pipe. I, okay, I'm, I'm good with the pipe. I'm mostly worried about other washouts. So when you say 600,000, how, how much of that downslope on Quail Hollow are we going to be looking at? I can't, I can't answer that, Bob, and not unless we do further exploration. We have no, you know, you get indications in the road because the trench sinks, you start to get, you know, like bird bass or, or settling. And that's what we have at the upper end. And then the lower end, we're working now. The road just came down and we had the steel plate. Um, I, I mean, so I, I we probably we... won't know again until next winter or, or that. And now if you want to go out and do trench, you know, I think we need to explore the whole thing. Well, we looked into um, uh, when they call it not X raying, but we looked into. They could do potholing. Yeah, and we could do potholing and that. But, Something. You know, that, that will get expensive as well. But we, <laughs> we cannot have um, Quail Hollow compromise. I mean, the, the worst thing that happens is Quail Hollow washes out and. Um, you know, we get another disaster on nine. Uh, well, you know, we excavated above and below, and, and above is where we found, you know, continual voids, and we're addressing those. And we went a ways below, I think we went 100 feet below the last void we found, and we found uh, the backfill to be in you know, integrity to be fine. I think we need to consider doing more. So. Okay. Are you going to go? No, I mean it's you know it's a it's a real it's a real shame. I think we learned something from this project about how to be operating inside of sand hills in terms of county standards and that sort of thing. Um, I, I think there's a opportunity here for collaboration so that we don't repeat this in the future because we will surely have other pipes that we're going to be putting into that same kind of uh, environment. Agreed. Um, so I, I mean, let's fix this first, but let's not lose sight of the fact that we need to make sure that we're not being told by the county next time we go in there, do it this way again, right? Um, fool me once. So, um, but yeah, I, I really would strongly, I, I do not want this, us to find out about a failure in the middle of a rainstorm. With a car and a hole. No, I agree. With a car and a hole that's or a, a potential he's probably agree. Okay. Other questions, uh, Jeff? So, have we reached any kind of conclusion as to how much of this problem is the result of county standards that we've worked to, and how much of it is other unknown factors or things we didn't do right? We have not. Okay. Um, just as an observation, I happened to drive Quail Hollow Road yesterday, and uh, we had uh, one man down the trench, and a, a stretch about the width, about the length of this room, unpaved basically. I mean, it just had loose, uh, some loose asphalt on it. And they were working down there at the lower end. I did notice some potholing up at the upper end, particularly right at toward the beginning, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, it was difficult for me as a, um, an outside observer, basically, to tell where they had actually repaired and completed the repair. Uh, comparing that with other places on the, the whole stretch of road, you know, you, you see a, a line of dark asphalt in the middle and that it's been, uh, compacted and everything. So it's difficult, it was difficult for me to, you know, I didn't stop or ask anybody anything. I just happened to be driving down there. It was difficult to note where they had already fixed things versus where it hadn't been touched yet, uh, other than the fact that some of the places have a pretty substantial pothole. Correct. And I, I think to make that even more difficult, Jeff, the county's doing dig outs and getting ready to, for sealing for the winter. 
and there's additional dig outs along Quail Hollow, you know, in, in deficiencies in the asphalt. And that makes it even a little more difficult to find where they were working. We can provide you some mapping if that would help. I mean, I don't know that would, but we could get that detailed for you. Now, I, I was just observing, I, you know, not my job to stop and ask questions or anything. I drove by because I was going through that area anyway. And uh, um, but they, they were working, it was a small crew, five or six people perhaps, plus a couple of uh, road guards. Yeah, the, the big dig out was just below the entrance to the quarry. That kind of gives you a landmark. Um, I don't have any specific questions about you know this particular emergency contract amendment, but I I guess it it would be great if we could do like a sort of overall debrief on this project to look at the entire cost from the original work all the way through because you know we've we've done several contract amendments on this work so just it feels like you know it'd be good to sort of have a debrief on the process at some point so that we can you know understand the the total impact of this one project um <clears throat> but otherwise okay. um rick i wanted to clarify what you were saying earlier um so i thought i heard you say and we're close to expending 600k we are so you well exceeded the 250 already and they're now okay. they, they've exceeded been working again. what's that oh exceeded again they, yeah they've been and working we we're just getting we were just getting the pricing and the actual costs have been coming in this week for the breakdowns and yes they have extended didn't think they have that yet but they have so so we so we're playing a little catch up um we're close to exceeding 600 and that's what you're asking us for but we're not done we're not working we are not so this number isn't going to be 600k no. this is going to be just a, a million could be up to a million okay. we'll know more when we open up and, and Garrett, do we have an idea when we're going to open up the entrance right now they're following the void uh past the sand plant okay especially uh, if we do the whole uh, road so if we have done about 250 feet so far is what i saw in your memo okay uh i, I was thinking we had done 250 feet for 250,000, but <laughs> no we've done 250 feet for maybe half a million uh, you, you've said we finished 250 feet and there's this other area near the entrance. It's about how much addition? Mm, I can't tell you. I just know that okay. there's an area. Okay. Mark. Um, okay. Um, I, I can tell you that the sinkholes there are, are only less than 100 feet. Yeah. Of sinkholes. Maybe, maybe 50, 75 feet. There's only a few of them. Um, is the county out there on a not a daily basis, a regular basis, uh, approving this sort of on an ongoing basis? Because um, helping, uh, not helping so much, but saying <laughs> yes, we're good with. Because what I see in the design that you're using, or what you've described, putting these drainages in, that's not wasn't part of the original design. No, it was not. That was because of the amount of water flow. That, once we, we brought on a, a team of experts, uh, of engineers, um, Shop and Wheeler, MME, and then there was a couple of others that uh, MME brought in and said it was important to get that dewatered and to put that drain in um, so we could do the work. Um, and we had a significant flow. Now, that flow has dropped way off to nothing right now. But this piping that you're putting in, is part of the permanent installation at that location, at not that, location. that not planned at the next location uh, up at the entrance because we don't have the water. Right. Okay. Uh, but 
you're uh, doing things that that aren't part of anybody's design, right? Right now. Because Correct. The design was with the shop and wheeler and MME and approved by the county. Okay, and oh, and approved by the yeah, county. We okay. submitted to the account to the county. So the county had that then, and the oh, yeah. is the county there on an ongoing basis? I don't believe so. Have you seen them here? Here are they? No, they're not making daily we, site visits. We, we are doing video or pictures or something like that of the. Yeah, there's daily logs and photographs of all the work. Okay, so then we got their approval at the beginning. The reason I'm going here is I don't know how much of this is uh, conditions that we're experiencing uh, in the field with oh, this is what it's like now. How are we are we changing uh, design on the fly at all to accommodate what's there, or are we following through on the design that the engineering team and the county has given us and bought off on, and that's what we're using for this repair work area outside of the the drain? Because I think we're done installing uh, the drain. Okay. We're using uh, a, the backfill that we feel that will let the water move through, right. and then with slurry, right. um, and that right. we're following as a trench backfill and as a void backfill. Right. And did the county, and that's assessed as we go. And did the county then buy off on this green yes. system? Then okay, all right. Um, are we doing as built drawings then? Yes. So after the. Okay, after this is all completed. Okay. Um, and I'm guessing the all of this money for now is coming from reserves. I would have to double check that with Kendra, but I would say so. Yes. Do you have any other pockets? No, I do not. Okay. I would say yeah, yes. I'm guessing with magic money. Where this is magic coming from. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. And we have had extensive discussions with FEMA. And it is on its way, hopefully, to be obligated. And then that will reimburse us 75%. But it has not been obligated. Yes, but the, the odds we're, are we're, we're, we have that expectation that, that they will reimburse that. Uh, we I, have I that don't have that yet. But uh, we're not there yet. No. And if they do, how much have we asked so them to? Reimburse. Well, with with FEMA, Jeff, you put in a scope of work. Okay. The scope of work say it's to. And then you send them the bill. And then they pay if they obligate your scope of work, then they pay actual seventy five percent of actual costs. Okay. Um, to the point that Bob was making earlier about wanting to have some assurances or investigating the rest of the area. I think we need to do something. We need to, to, to look at. To look, to look, let me finish, Bob. Uh, to look at the rest of this area also, uh, some way, and get the engineering teams involved that you that you've had. I think it would be appropriate to bring back to the board a, a, a map, just showing this. Here's what we've done the repairs. Here's what we saw in this area. Here's. The, you know, the, the entrance, whatever that extent is also. And then here's what we've done in the, in the rest of the areas. And if it's spacing out some, some potholes or if it's doing some other kind of uh, compaction probe assessments, whether it's through any geophysical method or something else like that, but something else down that line to assess what does the rest of it look like? And I don't think that we that we we would ever get to a hundred percent assurance with these other methods unless we excavated everything. And I'm not okay. and I'm not of the opinion that we need to excavate everything, but I would like some level of confidence rather than just eyeballing. For where the depressions are, or for where the sinkholes are in the in the asphalt, something along the rest of it that says, yeah, we tested three other locations on the rest of the line there where we didn't see anything, 
and we didn't see any voids in it. So, so we think that something like that. something along the pipe. I, I I get concerns that there may be voids under Quail Hollow Road that have nothing to do with our project. That you know, I don't want to start lifting and looking, and all of a sudden we find that Quail Hollow Road is undermined in multiple locations. I'm not suggesting to look at other So I'm, I, you know, I'm a little, little nervous moving ahead, but I totally get that we need to make sure about the integrity of our pipe, pipeline trench. Talk, talk to the engineers yeah. and see what they would recommend to somehow assess the stability, the, the backfill material, the compactions there, and what's under the trench in these other areas. There's, there's yeah, potholing is one way. Is there is there a, a Pro, way? video? Yeah. Whatever. And, no, it, it, and we've been looking at different it's, techniques to see if that we can X-ray. We there's different ways of doing things to find voids. Is, is ground penetrating radar? Yeah. Is that? And we kind of ruled, the consultants kind of ruled that out. Okay. But you can find voids with that, but these voids are probably too small and not of the right. So but there's nothing. So, and there is potholing we could do, you know, with a back truck, you know, right over the main. Um, there's things that we can do, and, and we'll discuss that with okay. the, with the team. Talk to talk to them, discuss that, and see what. And uh, I would like to see something after you've had this discussion with with the engineering team. If you could show us something, if not the next meeting, the one after that, on this, so that we can see. How, how about we bring this back to the engineering committee? I think that that's and well, set up the full board and each meeting tomorrow. Yeah, but I mean the next engineering the committee. Month. Yeah, and, and and we may be able to, you know, if we if I get something concrete, then I can ask for a special engineering committee meeting. Okay. Um, and I then once we get a a solution from our discussions, then I can bring it to the full board for approval. That's I think that's good. Go. That's good. Can I ask one more question? Move this. Oh, sure, I thought you were done. It'll at least move this along and give us some, give the board some level of comfortability. Okay, we have looked beyond where we see these depressions in the in the asphalt. And some level. Okay, so um, I am not a geologist, but I live on a sand hill. And I've been looking at a cross section of one for the last 35 years out my front window. And I know that you've got lots of loose sand, but you go down a ways and you run into what is generally known as poorly agglomerated sandstone. It's not, it's, it's, it's sand, it's stuck together. If it had been stuck together for another 50 million years, it'd probably be real hard sandstone, but it's not. Um, and one of the things I see when I look across the street at this cross section where it was cut is all manner of gopher holes and things like that that make parts of that hillside look like Swiss cheese. And so, and also act as conduits for rainwater that washes out of the side of the hill when it rains. So we may want to think about some of these sand hills, you go down 100 feet, it's all soft sand. Some of them, you've got this poorly agglomerated sandstone, which will support, you know, I've, I've got holes this big around across the street from my house going into the hill and coming out somewhere else. And uh, this winter, we've lost a lot of the hillside because those things have gotten wet and the hill has lost, this, this poorly agglomerated weak sandstone has lost its integrity and collapsed. So it would be useful, I think, to know what's down there because you may well have resident gopher holes or, or old roots that rotted away a hundred years, a thousand years ago that left tunnels. And if you want to see that, you can come over to my house and I'll show you. <laughs> um, well, we did some geotech work okay. before, the, before the project started. So we did know what the soils are like along that line. This is part of our standard process. Uh, but did we know every inch of it? No. Yeah, that's not what I, I guess my point is that that's if you got the rigid stuff, that, that this poorly agglomerated sandstone, 
um, it will support a pretty good size, you know, gopher bowl type thing running through it for quite some distance. And you might have run, you might be running into that. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to I don't tell you how you are, you are, but, but we'll, we'll assemble a team, put our heads together and come up with some recommendations. And, okay. and because we've had conversations, uh, we're concerned about the entire right. night. Uh, and um, agreed. Okay. Then I'd like to make the motion that the board direct the district manager to amend the existing contract with Anderson Pacific uh, in an amount not to exceed 600000 uh, for the repair of the bale potable water main of Quail Hollow Road. I will reluctantly second that. Okay. Uh, so we'd like to hear from the public to see if there are any questions or comments on this issue. Seeing none, uh, Holly. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. Okay. Um, moving on then, um, new business, um, the 2021-22 stream flow uh, report. Yes, and uh, the district's uh, environmental planner is here to do the introductions, uh, and we have a consultant as well. Carly. Thank you, Rick. All right, this item is a presentation by the district's consultant balanced hydrologics on the water year 2021 and 2022 stream flow salinity and temperature monitoring and operation gauging report balance began working with the district in 2014 to collect this valuable data the data is used yeah sorry <laughs> this data is used to inform regulatory agencies assist with operations and establish a baseline for future projects in water year 2019, a more refined monitoring and diversion management program was developed, reducing gauging to dry season monitoring and removal of gauges on non-operational diversions. The district also requested to separate the ecological and operational gauging. These ecological data will be used to evaluate the potential impacts of the district's diversions on stream flow and temperature for ecological regulatory purposes, for habitat monitoring and for conjunctive use studies. While the operational data will be used to better understand how its diversions may affect flow and habitat values, ensure compliance with water right bypass requirements, and allow for treatment operators to easily access, assess uh, diversion flows. Annually, Balance completes a report exploring the data collected during the water year, and this 2021-2022 report is included as part of the memo. I'm also happy to welcome Chelsea Neal from Balance Hydrologics, who is with us tonight to present the report's findings and highlights. And after the presentation, Chelsea and staff are both prepared to answer any questions the Board of Public may have. Welcome, Chelsea. Thanks, everyone. Um, <coughs> here tonight to share the monitoring that we did for dry season 2021 and 2022 um, for stream flow and temperature for the water district. So, uh, giving a little bit of project history, Balance first began stream gauging for the district in 2013 2014. We started out with a pretty robust monitoring program. Um, I think there were about 13 gauges on nine different creeks. Um, with the goal of really understanding all the various watersheds and the um, relationship with all of the district's diversions. As Carly mentioned, we did this monitoring program for about five years and then worked with the district to refine the program, um, seeing what was really important and how we could narrow down our scope. We also did a few um, key for specific studies during that initial five-year period. Um, in as Carly mentioned in 2019, we did split the ecological gauging and the operational gauging. 
And for 2021, um, for the ecological gauging, we further refined. This was right after the CZU fire. And so with much of the district diversions had been lost, some of our gauges had been lost, we decided to only monitor on Foreman Creek for 2021. And in 2022, we monitored on both Foreman and Boulder Creek. And then we've also been doing the operational gauging, which was originally on Clear Creek and Fall Creek. Um, that gauge was also destroyed in the CZU fire, and now it's just Fall Creek for the time being. This is a summary of the 2021 stream flow. If you'll remember, 2021 was a critically dry year. There was about um, just under 19 inches of rain here in Boulder Creek. That was about 37% of average. And at the USGS Big Trees gauge, the mean annual stream flow was about 16% of average. 2021 was the second consecutive dry year and was also the first year post fire that we did monitoring. So up top on this graph, this is precipitation. This is just for the dry season from May to October. And then we have stream flow. So this is Foreman Creek. Um, at the beginning of the season in May and June, flows ranged from about 0.1 to almost up to 0.2 CFS. In mid-July, this is when the district stops its operation of its diversion. You can see the increase in flow up to about 0.2 CFS, and then the recessional flow for the remainder of the dry season. In terms of temperature, we like to look at the seven-day forward rolling average. This is a metric that local fisheries biologists have come up with. It's a threshold for steelhead, and it's staying below that threshold is the most viable for um, juvenile rearing. Um, and so here we see Foreman Creek stayed well below that 20 degree threshold with maximum temperatures at 16 degrees Celsius. For 2022, also a dry year, though not as dry. Um, there was about 37 inches of rain here in Boulder Creek, about 74% of average. And the mean annual flow at the Big Trees gauge was 54%. This is now the third consecutive dry year. I'll also mention that the Foreman Creek gauge was buried during the debris flows of 2021. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Similar graph here with the precipitation up on top. In orange, we have the Boulder Creek stream flow, which started out during the season at about 0.4 CFS and then receded down to about 0.2 CFS for the remainder of the season. <laughs> Foreman Creek um, had a little bit more water in water year 2022. Flows range from about 0.2 to 0.1. And then when the district stopped its uh, diversion, flows went up to about 0.3 CFS. You'll also probably notice um, at the end of the season, you see a slight rise in the hydrograph. That's um, during the fall as leaves start to fall and there's less evapotranspiration. We tend to see base flows generally rising during that time of year, even if there's no precipitation. Once again, for temperature, um, stayed well below the 20 degree Celsius threshold. The maximum uh, temperature on Boulder Creek was 19 degrees Celsius and on Foreman, a little bit warmer than what we saw in 2021, um, about 17. You'll also notice that there's a temperature reversal um, where Boulder Creek is warmer in the summer and then cooler in the winter. We've noted this temperature reversal every year that we've done monitoring. As I mentioned, uh, there was the debris flow on Foreman Creek. On the top here, these are photos of before the debris flow. Starting on the left here, um, we have the district's diversion, and below is after. Oops. Um, and you can see all of the sediment and the changes in vegetation. This was our gauge prior to the deb debris flow underneath a uh, root wad here, and that pool was completely buried by the sediment. And this is standing at our gauge looking upstream. You can see the pretty dramatic difference in the channel. Um, some of you may have seen, there was some ring doorbell footage from the debris flow that was actually taken from this deck here, just across from where our gauge was, just upstream of Highway 236. This is what Fall Creek looked like before the summer um, at the fish ladder. So balance has been operating a stream gauge on Fall Creek upstream of the diversion starting in 2013. 
But in 2018, we worked with the district to install a real-time gauge. This was the setup with our gauge here. And this gauge reported directly to the um, district's SCADA system, as well as to an online portal that Balance hosts. And um, this information has been really critical for um, the district in terms of managing the diversion. They can actively see how much flow is being bypassed and make any adjustments needed to um, the diversion operation. We did remove all the equipment prior to construction and have been working with the contractor um, to make sure that we're still accounting for flows during this construction season and then can reinstall when the construction is finished and the new fish ladder is in place. I will also say water year 2023 was a remarkable water year as we're all aware. And so unfortunately both the Boulder Creek and Foreman Creek gauges were lost during the high flows. These are photos that show Boulder Creek prior to the storms and afterwards um, this is what it looks like and our gauge is gone. Similarly on Foreman Creek, our gauge is underneath this large duck fir tree, which fell over on top of the gauge and you can see the root wad burying where the gauge used to be. Just a quick summary, the gauging program that Balance has been doing has provided a quantitative base baseline for stream flow and temperature over a range of conditions we've monitored both extremely dry and extremely wet years. The 2021 and 2022 water years represent consecutive dry years, actually the second and third consecutive dry year. The Foreman Creek gauge was buried in 2021 and had to be reinstalled for 2022. We saw that the flows in Foreman Creek were slightly lower in 2021 than 2022. And the water temperature remained well below the 20 degree threshold um, at all of the gauges during this period of monitoring. One observation that we've made over our years of monitoring is that the thermal effects from the diversion seem to be very minimal. Um, it's an observation that we've made for a number of years now, which um, is really positive from an ecological and habitat perspective. The Fall Creek real-time gauge continues to be a critical asset to the district's operations. And finally, both gauges were destroyed in 2023 and will need to be replaced. That thanks for your time and happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. Yeah. Um, let's start with questions, Jeff. Huh? All right. Jamie? What do we lose over the period of time where we don't have gauges in place in terms of data collection? Will we have some you know, you know, loss of data integrity um, until we can get that back. Yeah, so right now there's no data that's being collected because those gauges were unfortunately lost in the storm. So there's there's no data being collected this summer right now until they're reinstalled. But is there any other way for us to like backfill that information until we can get that replaced? Or like, what, how do we, what do we do about future reporting when we have that kind of a, a hole in our in our data collection? Yeah, I mean, typically, you know, we leave the gauges in place. We'll remove, we'll leave our, you know, staff plate and the stilling well, the, the main infrastructure, which is not particularly expensive in place. And we'll remove the expensive pressure transducers for the winter when they're likely to get washed away. Um, but often we'll try and put them back in and would have done so at the beginning of this year, but without them being there, it was a little bit more challenging. Um, yeah, it's definitely tricky. You can look at, um, other gauges and try to do a uh, correlation um, with how flows work. And we have a lot of previous data that's been collected. So you can try to come up with a decent correlation to how these uh, watersheds respond to other watersheds and try to fill in information that way. Can I add to that as well? Yeah, um, I will also state, as we talked about, this has been a pretty different water year um, that we have a lot of water in the streams. So from the regulatory perspective, they're less interested uh, probably in this water year, they're really looking for like the critically dry periods. I um, mean, that's where the, they're looking for different habitat impacts. So even if we do have this hole for this summer, um, it's it's not necessarily going to impact our permitting in the future or working with the regulatory agencies. <coughs> okay. Good. Mm -hmm. well, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm really glad. I mean, for me, the key takeaway is uh, continues to be the thermal effects. I mean, that's the, the thing I really care about. The rest of it is is good data for you guys, but from policy point of view, that's what I'm interested in because there are entities that um, I think are not particularly happy with our water rights applications, and um, this I think continues to show that our surface water use is uh, de minimis impact on the overall environment and that our water rights should continue as they are and as we want them to be. Um, I, I think, I mean, as I recall, we've we spent somewhere around $800,000 or something like that on the original five year or, or program or something like that. I mean, it was an enormous amount of money gathered an enormous amount of data from a lot of different locations. Um, I, I think the focus on the ones that we have here is probably a, an appropriate compromise between amassing lots and lots and lots of data versus data that's actually can be used for what we're trying to do at a policy level. So yeah, um, thank you for continuing to do that. Yeah. And, you know, having established that long record, it's, you have a lot more to, to gain and to show that, like, you know, we have collected this data. This is what we've learned. And so I think that puts you in a really great position with the regulators, too, in terms of, you know, being able to understand uh, the watersheds and um, how they're working. Yeah. And this data goes right into our EIR, right? Right. It will yeah. be feeding all the modeling that yeah. we're doing right now. So that that's the second thing I care about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So uh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so to kind of follow up on what Bob was saying, this isn't regulatory required. No. No. We're doing this um, for our benefit then so that we can have this to substantiate uh, exactly. the EIR. And in, yeah, any permitting we go through when we have any okay. discussions with regulatory agencies, it's really good to show here's the data record we have. Right. It, it may not be required, Mark, but it's regulatorily adjacent. And in fact, the way that it works is if you don't do this, you aren't going to get what you want. Um, okay, thank you, Bob. Um, so, um, as a scientist, I have to ask the question, how much data is enough data? <laughs> I didn't want to ask that. <laughs> um, well, um, it's a good question. I, I did a lot of groundwater monitoring uh, as an environmental consultant, and it was always this, how much data is enough data? Um, so I need to pose that question to our two experts here. Uh, we have nine years worth at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and the point that Bob made on no changes in the water temperature when the diversions are shut off versus when they're when they're working. Great. I like that conclusion. But we have enough data to say that conclusion for now. Can, can I offer a political statement on that? Until we get our water rights fixed, then maybe we can stop. We get our permits and everything in place. Then we can stop. Okay. Then we okay. Can maybe I can I can I can see maybe that. take it, you know, right. yeah. dial, dial it down. Back, right. right. We have dialed it back considerably but, in the beginning. But this evening you're not asking us for additional budget approval. Right. This is already yet. Yes. <laughs> so the reason we have this gap right now during this time period is because we did go out to bid for this work. Right. Um, so we have two proposals and we're bringing that to the board, uh, probably this next upcoming meeting. Or we might try to bring it to the committee first. Let's, we'll have to discuss that. But ideally, we bring it to the board and get the contract in place so we can start collecting the data again. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Uh, or as long as we need it to then substantiate changes that we're trying to make in our permitting mm -hmm. uh, environment and to support the EI. Right. And, and I will add to that, that okay. anytime you have an active diversion, it's not a bad thing to have some kind of data of what you are bypassing, because if something comes up where someone challenges us, we have that record to prove we're not going over our bypass limit. We're not, you know, like what we're doing at Fall Creek. Right. So right. we're always showing that we're within our water right, we're within our bypass. And at full support, uh, will we need that support the diversion, such as at Fall Creek? Mm -hmm. Yes, we should be taking that on an ongoing basis so right. that there's no question about that. But then rest of the data, but, but like, it doesn't sound like it's 
for a direct operational aspect of some understanding. It's more for the ecological, uh, here's how uh, it's responding, part of the record that we can use to substantiate the changes that we want to make in IR. Right. For the yeah. okay. All okay. creek is both, though we do use it for operational as well. Right, sure. Yeah. That's what I said for Fall Creek, yeah, that operational aspect and the limit on that. Okay. Let's keep in mind that, you know, from a water usage point of view, um, this district is performing at a level that a lot of people around the state would be like to be at. So we're not increasing our water usage. Um, and so all these concerns that people have about how much water we're taking out, we're, we're lower on a per capita basis than we were, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago. So substantially lower. So, uh, I mean, all that sort of rolls into the, hopefully rolls into the EIR that historically we're also taking out less than we used to on a per capita basis. Okay. Uh, well, answered, answered my question as to how much longer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> any comments uh, from the public on this item? Seeing none, uh, they're not asking us for any uh, motion at this point. That's right. No. Nope. <laughs> um, other than accepting this report. So, uh, we need a motion to accept it. Not clear on that. We have in the past. Yeah. Okay. So we could yeah. reject the report. Yes. Well, <laughs> <that's probably laughs> yeah. well if, if there was nothing to go there, we don't yeah. like it. Okay. And we should accept uh, the report. Yeah. Then uh, I move that the board accept the staff report and presentation concerning the water year 2021 22 stream flow, salinity, and temperature monitoring and operational gauging report. Second that. Oh. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackerman. Yes. Director Close. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Uh, moving on to. Thank you, Chelsea. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chelsea. Chelsea. Yes. Thank you. Item 5B uh, the Verizon Cellular Site. Yes, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, in February 2023, the district was contacted by Sequoia Development Services, inquiring if the district uh, was interested in leasing approximately 70, 750 square feet of land at either the district's Lion Water Treatment Plant or the Huckleberry Tank Site located in, in Boulder Creek. Of the two sites, the Huckleberry site is problematic with the neighborhood and uh, protected environmental species as that property is Sand Hills. And the district has run into oppositions in the past from uh, the neighborhood uh, as recently as talking about the KBZC or whatever radio station in Boulder Creek. Uh, so the, the district uh, directed uh, Sequoia towards the Lion site um, is a good location that has ample flat ground and is more uh, remotely located um, than the, the Huckleberry site. Uh, the initial uh, site visit of the uh, Lion Tank was uh, very pleasing to uh, Sequoia. Uh, they are proposing a, a lease of an additional uh, a term of five years plus uh, four years and five years automatic renewal options for a total of 25 years. They proposed a rent, uh, an annual rent amount of 15,000 uh, in discussion with other uh, real estate uh, type development folks that do this for a living. Um, 17,000 was more in line with other wireless sites because this is more of a wireless internet than it is cellular phone and uh, this there, I don't understand all this, but there's there a much greater value in this type of site. Um, in recent discussions with Sequoia uh, for Verizon Wireless, they would like to start architectural design, a survey, a draft lease, uh, and preliminary tower report at an estimated cost of $10,000 and ask that the, the district uh, approve their concept of installing a cellular site up at the Lion. 
treatment water site before moving forward as they're looking at expending funds. Uh, local public safety is very supportive of uh, the installation of another wireless communications facility in the, the Boulder Creek area. The service is, has been very unreliable during CZU and during the Atmosphere River of events, the recent events. There has been no cell service, no uh, internet service, and uh, no even texting uh, in the Boulder Creek area. Um, however, you know, wireless communications facilities can be very and most likely will be controversial in, in, in the populated neighborhoods as these towers have electronic equipment and antennas that receive and transmit cell phone signals using radio frequency RF waves. Uh, as part of the permitting process, uh, public outreach will be required and most likely the district would probably want to make sure that this board also did public outreach uh, moving ahead. Um, and uh, staff is asking the board to approve the concept moving forward. Okay, thanks. Um, questions, Jamie? I don't have any questions. I just have, you know, the desire to be able to use my cell phone between uh, 236 and uh, the outskirts of Boulder Creek. So if this would improve that, <laughs> so sounds like it would. You're ready to approve there. I'm, I'm very ready to move forward. It's a huge problem. I've, I've noticed that gap in cellular communications for years. I've been doing that commute over Skyline, you know, for a decade. So. Well, I don't know if it'll help with that necessarily. You don't think? It's possible. Did they lose their antenna during the fire? Is that the idea? I think it was a lot of power loss and, and just internet was down. And when it seems when the internet goes down, we lose everything. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure how it's all interconnected. But is this an augmentation or a, uh, or a complete new site? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some ways I wish we could get them to uh, help remediate our broom issue every year, um, right? Um, but I know they don't like doing that kind of thing. What about um, the environmental aspects for our employees that would be up at the site relative to um, cellular signals and that sort well, of thing? Well, the you know that's a that's a good question that that we should ask. You know, the site is not staffed all day long they're up there for a couple hours uh monday through friday and there's some some duties on the weekend but it's not a, a you know 24 hour or even an eight hour staff site but site do come and go and we wrote staff are rotated through the treatment plant so it's not the same staff individual up there all the time yeah. that's a good question well and uh where exactly would this be located relative to the plant and the tank and all that it's there should be some mapping uh on the uh, contract, but it's my understanding that we have, uh, those of you familiar with the site, there's two tanks, a large lion tank yeah. and a smaller little lion tank that sits up on a knob. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, up, be up on the knob by the uh, smaller lion tank. Okay, well, that's better because uh, the yeah. cellular signal goes off like this typically. Yeah, I, so as long as the building is generally under, um, sort of underneath the cone, um, there, there shouldn't be a tremendous amount of signal issues. And I imagine there will be a, you know, an environmental review and most likely that question will come up in the neighborhood. Yeah. And is this a 5G? Um, Don't know. They seem to be heavy on wireless internet. Well, I, I, I get that, but um, Jamie's question, if it's strictly internet, you're, from a voice point of view, you're screwed unless they're deploying VoIP. But um, it would be, I think, I think in terms of being able to offer this as a benefit to the community, uh, understanding a little bit more about what the benefits are, what services are being provided, uh, do they have a footprint that they're trying to cover on, this, on the cellular signals so that people can see, then in fact, it would benefit them. I think all these things would be really important for them to do, and particularly for us to understand if we're going to be the host of this, right? Because at some point, we're going to become the focus of the community. Um, right. And these are some questions that I would like to ask of them and, and get a little bit more information about it. I, I, you know, I, and, and I think we should, with the agreement, get into it with legal and make sure we cover subleasing because I know on our Scotts Valley site, there's multiple wireless companies on that one tower. We only receive 
lease um, payments from one company. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. In terms of, um, it's I think we're getting twenty five thousand more or less from our other uh, lease. Is that? I have to go check that. Uh, what size of footprint is that relative to this? I think it's about the same, but that's a unique lease down there because we don't own the property, but we have a lease. The county owns the property, but it's our easement that we're leasing out. So it's a little. That's that one's unique. And that's a, a busy site. There's multiple carriers on that cell site. And when does that lease expire? I couldn't tell you. When, where is that site? It's up by the probation tank, right above the probation center, oh. up on the sand knob by the cross. The cross used to be or still is. Okay, I've, I've not. Yeah, they, wow. they, they get to it through our now nice road, actually. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, most of that area is behind gates and things now. Yes. So. As sand hills, yeah, it's protected. And and when would we um, start engaging? Assuming we approve this tonight, when do we start engaging with them on getting so answers right now, to some of these things? We have already kind of had some you know non-binding discussions to get this far. I, I mean, I think what we're what we're saying tonight is not that we are approving a lease. What we're saying is that we're open to a conversation about the concept. Correct. And but. There's no obligation on our part, should we decide not to move forward with it sometime down the road, they're not able to provide answers or what have you, we're not obligated That's to, correct. to follow through on, on a signature. That's correct. Um, question there, Bob. I, I was under the impression that, uh, among other things, we were, would be agreeing to provide them with access to the site and and things yeah, like that to course. do some study. Yeah, diligence uh, yeah. activities. Yeah. 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 But what I'm what I'm getting at is that we are in terms of the communications to the community. Yeah. We are not approving a lease. We're exploring whether or not we can get answers, we need to get answers yes. in order to decide whether or not we should approve yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, as That's part of that we're not granting them access so yeah, yeah, yeah. Studies yeah, of course yeah we you have to grant them access for yeah. diligent purposes right yeah okay Jeff, questions um or have you asked well i asked and also uh, bob was very thorough it's okay thank you okay oh and noise right that should be covered as part of their environmental i would hope so yeah um so um in addition to what's been asked so do we know what the plan is for Verizon's environmental view? Do not. Okay. Um, are they doing the public outreach that you mentioned? I, I, from what I remember from our previous discussions with cell companies that there's a requirement as part of their permitting that they have to do public noticing and part of the environmental, they will have to post in the neighborhood. But I would also recommend that the district because it is a district property, um, would do some type of outreach or may at least make sure that there's a, something at a board meeting where people can voice concerns. Be, you know, because I don't think one of these can go in without opposition. You know, it's been my experience that you know there's a certain amount of people out there that really have issues with this type of communications. All right, whole in Saratoga. Um, What's our potential liability? Um, because I see indemnifications for them that are in this agreement. Uh, what's our potential liability of having this there? I'd have to refer to legal counsel on that okay. one. And we haven't I dug into that yet, but I'm more than happy to ask Barbara. Uh, at some point, Barbara, I'd like you to address that. I don't, it's just a question this evening. I don't think we need to delve into that, but it is something that I'd like to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what you're asking is they should hold us harmless if their people get hurt on site exactly. and all that sort of thing. That we're not standard, offers, yeah, yeah, standards. Standards. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That would be pretty standard. Yeah. But then also, uh, any damage from that installation itself, in, in the event of winds or the rest of that, if somebody on our site is injured, oh, you're talking about the final lease. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about the final. Right. Because I'm looking. You know, yeah, right down. Right. 
Right now I'm looking at the concept, which is we're right. going to allow them on our property. They need to indemnify us for any injuries, et cetera. Right now for ingress and egress to do their exploring, they would have to work out an agreement with the district. So um, we're going to have costs in uh, going through their due diligence, yep. assisting them on being up there any uh, legal reviews, all of the rest of your staff time, all of the rest of that. Um, is it appropriate to ask them for some type of an upfront fee outside of this lease, uh, annual lease fee? Uh, because you're gonna be expending costs just to get to a point of, do we wanna do this? Yep. So. You know, I think that's reasonable. I mean, we it, it, there will be, I'm not saying it's a considerable amount of time, but there is staff time. And I've known from past experience with cell companies, they get to a certain point, they do um, utilize staff time to get to that point, and then we never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you know, the county, other agencies apply, uh, they uh, charge permitting fees where you put a deposit down and it's time and time and material that you um, deduct from that, we could definitely do that. There will be you know, somewhat of a cost for legal to <laughs> review the agreements. Right. Um, uh, we'll have legal expense, and then we'll have uh, our own expense reviewing uh, the environmental, public meeting, so forth. Right. So I think it would be prudent. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, this kind of goes back to what we talked about in terms of applications for um, water meters. Water meters, same thing, yeah. Agreed. Which we still don't have mm -hmm. formality around. So it might be worthwhile to roll all this together in terms of permits and, and the like for people that want to make use of our resources, but with they have no obligation to buy themselves. All right. Right. Well, you know, staff can put together a, more of a of a one off than the water meters, but, but from a policy it's, it's point of same view, thing, same yeah. policy. Right. Yeah. They're expending staff resources um, and time yep. to then say, oh, no, we're done. Thanks. We so, can staff yeah. can put together a, a rough <laughs> estimate and I, ask for a deposit. I think that that would be appropriate. Nice qualifier. It would show that they're real. Well, I mean, and I'm, I'm sure they're real. real. And that they want to uh, seriously consider mm. this. But if I were them, I'd be talking to other people too. Or me, well, if I were them, I'd be talking to other people too. And they love they they try to stick with public agencies because they're easier to deal with. Yeah, than private parties. They try to. I I don't see the uh, the annual fee that they're that they're offering as being anything significantly beneficial to us from a from a money standpoint. However, to your point, if it provides better coverage for the for the Boulder Creek area, for the Valley area, well, then there's a public benefit there mm -hmm. that we can right. provide just by letting them post it. So- they, And it is a different form of revenue. It's not a water rate revenue. Right, mm -hmm. yes. But I still wanna ask the question about something up front, you know, based on what you think are quantifiable. Staff costs, legal costs, and any, anything else like that. Um, I see that they have in their agreement uh, termination options on their end. Uh, what termination options do we have on our end if we uh, don't like them at some point, or if we see that uh, for some reason we need to abandon that site? I, I guess the question would be, you know, um, is the expectation that this is what I would call MOU or LOI or what have you, are the only terms that would go into a final lease agreement. If that's the expectation, then they should be disabused of that. If this is just, hey, these are the things that we're thinking about, it's non-binding, it's no big deal, they can be changed later, all says that on non-binding, et cetera, then I'm not too worried about right. that. Then is it appropriate to get an example final uh, from them at this point, or let them do their due diligence? Yeah, uh, 
uh, to a point where it's not costing us much of anything. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, so I, I would tend to go that way. The, the county just redid the agreement, I think, three years ago, Carly, for the Scotts Valley cell tower, and that was a pretty extensive agreement. We can pull that to provide that to legal counsel. Um, you know, and I think Mark's got a really good point. I just didn't want to spend much money of I, I, district funds on it until we knew that they were seriously wanting to sit down. But if we charge them a deposit and get our cost recovery, we could start looking into this a little more. Yeah, I mean, the paragraph after the points is pretty clear about not being legally binding. I'm relaxed about that. Okay. Um, so I see that you have a motion here um, in front of us uh, from anything that we've talked about tonight, in particular, the um, any upfront funds. Do I need to modify this recommended motion? Probably not. Um, to, um, <laughs> to cover that somehow. Um, Probably. Because you can always come back to us two weeks from now. I move that the district approves the concept of a lease agreement. Um, actually, maybe it ought to be. <clears throat> do you have to sign this, um, Rick? You do. So I don't think so. It, yeah, it says acceptance. Is there? Yep, you got to sign it. Okay. So I think the motion is I move that we authorize the district manager to execute the concept of lease agreement with Verizon Wireless for the installation of a wireless communication facility at the district flying water treatment facility, comma, subject to mutually acceptable terms, including a deposit. I like that. Okay. Thank you, Bob. We don't need to specify an amount. Yeah. I'll figure out that is. We're going to get yeah. something that's equitable. Okay. I will second that. Thank you. Okay. Um, any comments from the public on this? Um, I see that uh, Cynthia has her hand up. Is that correct? Looks like it. Yes. <laughs> Uh, this is Cynthia from Felton, and I'm very interested in getting better communications during emergencies, so I fully support this type of project. My question is, will the district provide power for the cell location, and will it be uninterrupted power? Will there be a generator or battery backup for that cell tower power? Thank you. Gotcha. Yeah. The district will not provide power, but they will have a PG&E power drop of their own, and this would include a standby generator. Okay. Any other questions? I see none. Um, we have a, a motion with a, Friendly amendment, or you made the motion fully. I made the, I made the motion okay. fully. Okay. Okay. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackerman. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. Um, the consent agenda. Uh, does anybody have uh, anything that they want to comment on that? Don't want to pull it now. Uh, uh, written communication and formal information material. We have none on those. Um, thank you all. So this is seven forty eight adjournment. Thank you, Melissa. Have a good evening, all. Recording.